morning. Welcome you all to the Lord's house this morning. It's good to see each one gathered with us and especially to those that are visiting. We give you a very special welcome in our Saviour's precious name. After the preaching this morning we'll be meeting around the Lord's table and for those that are saved and walking with the Lord then we invite you to meet with us around the Lord's table. Being the first Lord's Day of the month and having the table there's no Sunday school today or refreshment so no Sunday school but there will be a message for the children during the service. God willing this afternoon at five will be our afternoon meeting. I'll be here returning to our studies in the book of Ezekiel. On Wednesday our brother Chris will be bringing the message at the prayer meeting. I encourage you all to come along on Wednesday evening and there won't be Zoom this week so no Zoom this week. Uh, but that will be back in the following week, God willing. Uh, bank West are no longer supporting churches for their bank accounts, and so our bank account will be closing in the next few weeks, well, about a month from now. And so in the bulletin, we've put the details for the new bank account, which is with Commonwealth Bank. And so for those that do normally transfer, if you could take note of that, please. And I'll update that, uh, please. If you need more help with that, do let us other bets know, please. I'm going to read from the Psalm 16, the Psalm 16, and the Psalm 16 is one of the Messianic Psalms pointing to our Lord Jesus, and the words at the end of the Psalm are is spoken of in the New Testament as being fulfilled in Christ in his resurrection. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or in the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Uh, today we rejoice that our Saviour's body does not lie in the grave. Our Saviour has risen triumphant. He has been shown the path of life. He has ascended up on high in the presence of the Father. There is fullness of joy at the right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. Uh, therefore today we rejoice in our Saviour's triumphant resurrection and ascension. As he appears at the Father's right hand, so each believer is seated there in him. And what pleasures then there are for us as <coughs> the Lord's people. May the Lord lead us in worship in God's house today. We'll seek the Lord's face briefly, please, in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for the return of the Lord's day. We thank thee for a day set aside for worship of our Lord's great name. And we pray today that the help of God will be granted as we spend this time at thy feet. Come, we pray, and stir our hearts up after thyself. Deliver us from spiritual slothfulness. And we pray that our hearts today will truly be engaged with thine. Grant help them to worship thee aright. We pray in our Lord's name. Amen. 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 Returning in our hymn books, please, to the front of the hymn book is the Psalm section. The Psalm 16. The Psalm 16. Sorry, the Psalm 32. The Psalm 32 on the page 29. The Psalm 32. Blessed is the man to whom is freely pardoned all the transgression he hath done whose sin is covered. The Psalm 32, rejoicing in the great forgiveness of sin. And we're singing to the end of the verse 5, ending with the words, forgive the iniquity. And we'll stand as we sing this.
We will seek the Lord's face together again, please, in prayer. Let's look to the Lord together. Our gracious Father, we rejoice in the great truth of this psalm. Every true believer can identify with it. How blessed is the one whose sin is covered. What blessing there is, what joy for those whose sins have been forgiven. We thank thee, dear Lord, that our sins have been blotted out. They have been taken out of the way. O oh Lord, we thank thee that as they have been covered over, that today thou dost gaze not on our sin, but upon the righteousness of thy dear Son. It is on that basis that we approach unto thee today. And we come not pleading any merit of our own. We come rather pleading all the merit of Jesus Christ. <coughs> we thank thee for him. We thank thee for his perfect life, for his atoning death, for his glorious resurrection and ascension. O oh Lord, we thank thee that with him we have all. O oh Lord, we thank thee for his fullness. And therefore, we can say that the believer is complete in him. O oh Lord, we pray today that the gospel of Christ will be that which delights the heart of every believer today. O oh Lord, we pray that our gathering will not be a mere feel-good experience, but rather that we will truly feed upon our Saviour afresh. <coughs> Encourage every believer, we pray, in thyself. Challenge us in our walk with thee. Lead us into a closer walk with thyself, we pray. We cry to thee that we will prove thee. And Lord, that we will be enabled to live for thee. Oh Lord, we do pray for any in our midst today that are still unconverted and Lord it is our earnest desire that their hearts will be open to the truth of thy word to the glories of Christ we pray that they will see the sinfulness of sin the exceeding sinfulness of sin they will see then the great provision that there is in our Savior Oh Lord, we pray that blinded eyes will be opened. Oh Lord, draw sinners effectively to thyself, we pray. Oh Lord, all around us we see the souls that are perishing without thee. Give us a heart of concern, we pray. Oh Lord, give us that agonizing spirit over them. And Lord, we pray that the very heart of Christ as he wept over Jerusalem, that we will weep over the souls of men and women. And yet we recognize that it is not our weeping that will see. We need the mighty intervention of the Holy Spirit of God. Oh Lord, we thank thee for this congregation. Oh Lord, we pray that thy hand for good will abide upon it we cry to thee for a time of refreshment a time of building up and we do pray lord that thou will be pleased to build thy church in this place we cry to thee that this preaching house will be the birthplace of many a soul and that it will be a place where the lord's people are instructed in thyself. So Lord, come and uh, do us good in thine house, we do pray for thy great honour's sake. In our Saviour's name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to
turn please to the hymn 380, 380, it's on page 330, when this passing world is done, when is sunk yon radiant sun, when I stand with Christ on high, looking o'er life's history, then Lord shall I fully know, not till then, on much. Great words of Robert Mary the Chief. We stand as we sing 300. <laughs>
in God's house, this Lord's day, but we would be less glad if we didn't have the children and the youth in with us. And when the minister asks someone to bring a message to the children and the youth, he doesn't expect them to tell them a scary story. But this morning I'd like you to imagine for a moment, if you will, that you are the oldest child in your family. Some of you don't have to imagine, you are. But imagine that you are in Israel and that you hear Moses saying to your parents and to all the other families gathered that God is going to send one last plague on Egypt and that on the 14th of next month all the firstborn children in each family will die. You can imagine, you can think, I hear him right? Can that really be uh, that on the 14th of next month, a God will come to every house in Egypt and the firstborn child will die? It seems impossible to imagine. But then you think to yourself, well, everything else that Moses has said has been true. When he said there would be flies, they were everywhere. When he said the locusts would come, they covered the earth. When he said there would be a plague of darkness, then everything was dark. And so you think, this must be true too. And so you imagine to yourself, what can I do? Well, first you think, I better run out of Egypt. If this is going to happen in all of Egypt, I need to get out of Egypt. But you can't. The Pharaoh won't let anyone go out of Egypt. And so you don't know. Uh, what to do. And then you hear Moses say to your parents, but God will make a distinction. It will be different for the people of Israel compared to the people of Egypt. And you say, oh, that is good news. That is the best news I've heard. I am so glad that I am a Jew, that I belong to Israel and not to Egypt. And then Moses says that to your parents and to all those gathered, well, it's not just enough that you are a Jew, it's not just enough that you belong to Israel. There are some things that you will have to do if you don't want your first eldest child to die on that night. And he explains it very clearly. He says there are four things, <coughs> pardon me, that you must do. Firstly, you must take a lamb. You cannot save yourself. Do you understand this? When the angel passes through Egypt and kills the firstborn of the Egyptians, it is not because they are worse sinners than you are as a Jew in Israel. You too have sinned, and the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. So someone must die for sin. And so Moses says, the first thing you must do is you must take a lamb. The lamb must die in the place of your oldest child. Secondly, it can't just be any lamb. You must find the best lamb, the most perfect lamb you can find. You can imagine going through the flock and trying to find the most perfect lamb that you can find. And then on that night of the 14th, before it becomes dark, you must kill the lamb. You must take its blood and apply it to the top and the side posts, door posts of your house. And then fourthly, Moses says there are also the special rules about how you are to eat this lamb. It is to be roasted, not boiled. It is to be eaten with unleavened bread, and there are other regulations required. I want you to imagine then that you are that oldest child. Imagine how carefully you would choose the lamb. You would check it every which way to make sure you have found the best lamb in your flock. Imagine how carefully then you would take its blood and apply it to the doorpost. You can see the young boy, how concerned his face is, looking at his dad saying, Dad, I hope you are doing this right. The dad is saying, we are doing exactly what God told Moses to do. Don't worry. You can imagine how carefully you would apply and everything that you've heard, how carefully you would treat that lamb. Your life depends upon that lamb. Well, the New Testament tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. It says, for even Christ, our Passover, 
is sacrificed for us. The young people, we must all face death. But that hymn that we just sang, Robert Murray McShane, he didn't even make 30 years of age. He died before his 30th birthday. But we must all face death. We cannot say it will be on the 14th of next month. But we do know that we have all sinned and the wages of sin is death. But in the New Testament, God has made the gospel much simpler for us even than those four points that we talked about for the Old Testament Jew in Egypt. Firstly, the lamb. We are told who the lamb is. We don't have to go and find him. In fact, we must not try to find another lamb. John the Baptist said when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There is one Lamb. We don't have to inspect this Lamb to make sure that he is good enough. The Bible tells us that God has sent his only begotten Son and that he is without sin, that he is spotless, unblemished, perfect, sinless. We can rest our souls on the perfection of this Lamb. But thirdly, we don't have to kill the lamb. God, to please the Father, it says to put his son to grief. To please the Father that his son will die as the lamb in our place. But there are many that think, well, if the Lord Jesus has died, his blood has been shed, then surely we are all safe. Many people treat the Lord Jesus Christ very casually in our day. They treat his name casually. They have no regard for the Bible. They have no regard for the church. Just as the Old Testament Jew had to treat that lamb very carefully because his life depended on it. We are no different in the modern day and age. We have to treat the Lamb of God very carefully. Our lives depend on on him. And there is one thing that we must do. Like the Old Testament, the Jew, we must take that lamb, take his blood, and apply it to our own hearts as it was applied to the doorposts. You say, how do I take the lamb of Jesus Christ and apply it to my heart? The Bible says you must be born again. You need a new heart born of the Holy Spirit of God. And with that new heart, you will apply the blood of the Lamb in two ways. In repentance for your sin and in faith, saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It may sound to many of us uh, too simple. Uh, can it really be uh, that simple that if I repent of my sin and put my faith in this Lamb, that I will be forgiven and safe and saved? The, the, Disciples asked the Lord Jesus once. They said, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What do we have to do to be safe, to be saved? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that he believe on him who he hath sent. In verse 40 of John chapter 6, he says, This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. The young people, you do not have to be afraid of death if you have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I will raise him up at the last day. Come for this prayer. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. But above all, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the lamb that you have provided. You saw us, Lord, in our helpless estate. In our simple ways, you saw that we could not save ourselves. And we thank you for your dearly beloved Son. I do pray, Lord, for each young person gathered in this morning, that, Lord, you may grant them this most precious gift, the gift of faith, saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give them, Lord, those broken and contrite spirits that are able to repent of sin in all sincerity. Oh Lord, to save them we pray and from an evil, a wicked generation and raise them up, Lord, to be men and women of God who will stand for our Saviour's name.
We thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Babs, for that message for the children and us all, for the wonderful thing to be drawn to the cross of our Lord. Before we have our offering, then we want us to have our systematic reading, First uh, Timothy chapter 3. If you have a Bible with you, you to turn there. First Timothy chapter 3. And Paul sets forth here the various credentials for those that would hold office in the house of God. It mentions in the first part of the chapter the bishops and then the latter part of the deacons. The word bishop means an overseer and in the New Testament the word is equivalent to being an elder so it's not two different offices. The bishop and the elder is one and the same. And so in the house of God we have elders and then there are to be deacons. And so, First Timothy chapter 3 and the verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the pillar, sorry, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And we'll end there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious and infallible truth. We're going to have the offering hymn now, please, the hymn 300. And 71, we will remain seated as we sing these words, please. 371, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thy heart mine. If you didn't come prepared for an offering, please just let the guy pass by. 371, remain seated. <laughs>
turn please in the Word of God to the Gospel according to Luke. The Gospel according to Luke and the chapter 7. The Gospel according to Luke and the chapter 7. Luke's Gospel and the chapter 7. And we're going to read from the verse 36. The verse 36. Last time we saw in the words previous to this, the unreasonableness of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And here we see an example then of one that was unreasonable. Luke chapter 7 verse 36. One of the Pharisees desired him, that is desired Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast, ju thou hast rightly judged. He turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same love of little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. They that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? He said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. And here again the Lord will bless the reading of his word. We'll seek the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. Let us each ask the Lord that he will be pleased today to come and to minister to our hearts. Our gracious Father, we thank Thee for the Gospel that already has been brought to our ears today. We pray as we come now and consider this passage together, that the help of God will be given. Oh Lord, we pray that this precious account will become even more precious to us today. And Lord, we do pray that each believer will rejoice in the greatness of the forgiveness of sins. For any that have never experienced what this lady experienced, we pray today that the eyes of the unconverted will be opened. Bring the lost, we pray, to thyself. So grant that help from heaven. We pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. 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 In life we often face 
competition in the sporting world. Uh, there is that desire to be the winning competitor or the on the winning team. In schoolwork often children can be competitive, desiring that place at the top of the class. There's competition. We want to do our best, we want to succeed. And Spurgeon, who preached in this particular portion that we have read, he entitled it, Loves Competition. Loves Competition. Perhaps that's not normally how we look at this portion, and yet what Spurgeon was saying is when the Lord asked the question, who loves most? It ought to be our desire that our response should be, I want to be the one that loves thee most. I think most of us would fall back from saying that we love most, but it ought to be our desire. Let me be the one that would love the Lord most. And the great challenge then arising from this passage for the believer is this. Are you one of those that really loves the Lord with this great love? Or are you like those in the church of Ephesus that are spoken of in the book of Revelation chapter 2? They had left their first love. Or of Laodicea that there's no longer that great heat for the things of God. There's this lukewarmness. Thomas Vincent said, the life of Christianity consists very much in our love to Christ. Without love to Christ, we are as much without spiritual life as a carcass without natural life. Faith without love to Christ is a dead now, the great lover in this particular scene is this woman that is described as being a sinner, a sinful woman. Now, of course, we are all sinners. But the way that it's worded here at the beginning of this account in verse 37, there was a woman in the city which was a sinner. It suggests to us that her sin was of a sexual nature. Uh, this was a lady of the street, uh, and her sin was known. It, it was no secret as to what lifestyle this lady followed. I should say there's no scriptural support for the view that this is Mary Magdalene. That is the invention of the Church of Rome. And so uh, Rome and some of the Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, they teach that this is Mary Magdalene. Now, we do read of Mary Magdalene in the next section in chapter 8, but uh, there's nothing that ties these uh, two matters together. There's no scriptural evidence that Mary Magdalene lived uh, the lifestyle that this lady had lived. Nor are we to confuse it with Mary of Bethany, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Uh, so there was a time when Mary of Bethany anointed the Lord much later in our Lord's ministry, also in the house of a man called Simon, but in that case he was Simon the leper. And on that occasion the complaint was by Judas as he complained about the generosity of Mary of Bethany. But coming back to this scene, how did this great lover, if we describe her in that way, how did she express this Love. She wanted to be where Jesus was. And so when she heard that Jesus was in this home, she came to where he was. She desired to be in his presence. And if we are these great lovers, it will be manifested in this way. I want to be where the Lord is. I want to be in the secret place before the Lord where he has promised to meet with us. I want to be in the place of public worship 
Uh, again, where the Lord has pledged that he would meet with his people. We want to be where the Lord is. Then she came in humility. She came in brokenness. And her great tears then are the evidence of her love. She came in service. She came washing the Lord's feet with her tears. The work of washing feet was the work of a servant. She doesn't despise that lowly task. She does it with delight because love brings service. A Christian service flows from a heart of love. And then she came showing her gratitude and generosity. She came with this alabaster box of ointment. And she didn't calculate up the cost of this and say, that is too much to use on this occasion. Perhaps in past times she had used ointment like this in her sin. But now she poured it out in gratitude. This generous gratitude upon Christ's feet. Now I understand that some would take this passage and uh, preach those points that I've just mentioned and effectively they would preach love. And they would say, you must love to be where Christ is. You must do Christian service. You must have a generous spirit. And you go away either prideful in the foolishness of your heart thinking you've done it. So you go away either prideful or you go away deflated. But this lady neither went home prideful or deflated. Verse 50, she went home in peace. She went home in peace. Because you see, those matters that I've mentioned are the manifestations of love. And what we have to discover in this passage is that there was something that brought the manifestations. And so that's what we are to yearn after, that these other things were to follow. Now, of course, we are to have the brokenness. We are to have the service. We are to desire to be where the Lord is. But we'll not have it. We'll certainly not be able to sustain it until we have what this lady had. That is the sense of the forgiveness of sin. The sense of the forgiveness of sin and the sense of how great her sin was and therefore how great the forgiveness was. And so the takeaway from this passage really is this. Let me see what the lady saw. And let me continually see what this lady saw. Let the gospel thrill my heart. Deliver me from slavish law keeping. But may grace, may the gospel enable Christian obedience. Here then is this recognition of forgiveness. I've attacked the message then, the greatest lovers. Who are the greatest lovers? The greatest lovers rejoice in forgiveness, having the greatest understanding of God's eye. The greatest understanding of God's eye. And you see, when this Pharisee called Simon invited Jesus into his home for a meal, and the lady came in uninvited. And that might seem to us very strange. But in the customs of the day, I'm told that a meal like this would normally be served in a courtyard. And uh, that is a courtyard within the home. And people passing by could actually walk in. They could look in and see what was taking place. And those that were eating... They were not sitting on chairs like you are this morning. They were reclining around the table. And so the feet would be behind them. And so the lady was able to come right in to where Jesus was eating. 
and she had this access right to his feet. Now as we I think of the contrast between Simon the Pharisee and the woman, we could say in a sense the contrast isn't great. We have this lady who had lived a lifestyle of great sin. In contrast, we have a man who is very religious, very self-righteous. But they were both sinners. The woman, her sin was known and she could recognize it. But Simon was a hypocrite. If you look with me what it says in verse 36, one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And it sounds good, doesn't it? Some have actually taken that to say it's good to invite the Lord into your house. Well, it is good to invite the Lord into your house, but don't follow the example of Simon the Pharisee. Simon did it out of pretense. He had no love for the Lord at all. Why did he desire the Lord to come? Because he had doubts about what people were saying about Jesus. When he heard people say Jesus is a prophet, he wanted to prove that wrong. Simon was a hypocrite. And the Lord exposed his hypocrisy to him. The Lord said, you invited me to come, but when, you, when I came, you didn't show me the usual courtesy. You didn't have any facilities for the washing of my feet. You didn't greet me with the, the kiss of the welcome. It was all just a trap. What contrast we have then with the lady. If you look with me, in the verse 39, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she is a sinner. At this point, Simon ought to have been trembling at his duplicity. Simon ought to have been trembling. I have invited Jesus, but it's not out of genuine love. It's out of hypocrisy. I want to find fault. And so he has these thoughts in his mind. All the time he goes on excusing his sin. But the lady has a great sense of her sin. That's why she's come in the first place. She has sensed the awfulness of her sin, but the greatest, the greatness then of forgiveness that there is for that sin. As the lady came, does it not show that she had this sense that the Lord knows everything? The Lord sees all. There's nothing concealed from the Lord. And therefore, in her case, while her sin had been public, it could be confessed. And repented of publicly. She could come in public. Grief over it. But the Pharisee. No sense. That the Lord saw. Right into his heart. Now you think of when the Lord. Had spoke to him as he did. And showing as he did in the parable. I know everything about what you've been thinking. Immediately again, this Pharisee ought to have been crying out for mercy, but there's no such cry. The great lover then recognizes God sees all. God sees all. And not only does he see the awfulness of my sin, but as I have come in brokenness, as I have come pleading for mercy, he sees the greatness of what that forgiveness is. And so she then is a great lover. But I want to move on secondly and see that the great lovers rejoice in forgiveness, having the greatest understanding of God's ledger. God's ledger. The Lord told a parable here. 
there was a lender. And the lender had two debtors. One had a great debt of 500 pence, the other a smaller debt of 50. It's not the point of this sermon, but this does show us that not all sin is the shape is the same. And we live in a day of great biblical ignorance. Uh, many that profess the Lord's name have this teaching that there's no degrees of sin. All sin is the same. The scripture is clear that there are some sins that are more heinous than others. Now all sin is heinous in the sight of God. It's a dreadful thing to be a 50 pence sinner. There are sins that are more heinous. So this woman's sin was more heinous. And the reason why some have that teaching that all sin is the same is because they want to excuse the serious nature of various sins. But coming back to this scene, both were bankrupt. Neither had the ability to pay. But in the parable, both are forgiven. Frankly, it says, that is fully and freely. And so the Lord asks the question, which of these that have been debtors would love the most? The one that had owed 50 and has been forgiven, or the one that owed 500 and has been forgiven? And for all Simon's blindness, he could see that. It's going to be the one that owed 500. The one that has been forgiven the most will love the most. And in the parable then, the big debt sinner is the woman. She had this huge debt. She had sinned grievously before God. She had no ability to pay and she is forgiven. So what is this ledger that I've mentioned? The ledger it was a, an old way of keeping a record of debt. And so this creditor, this lender, when he gave the money, he could write in the ledger, so-and-so owes me so much. And when a debt was paid then, it would be seen to balance on the other side. Now, this woman had much recorded in the ledger of God. The scripture says here her sins were many, multiplied. And so if we were to think of every sinful thought that that woman ever committed, every sinful action, it, it, it calculates up to a huge debt, and it's right, she had no ability to pay. But going back to the Pharisee, he was also in debt. God had a record of every one of his sins. And don't we see some of his sins here, his scheming, his hypocrisy? And he also had no ability to pay. But in the parable, I believe Simon is not the 50 pence sinner. Because Simon has never felt himself to be in debt. Even if it hadn't been pointed out to Simon, what you're doing is wrong, he would have this idea, I will make amends through more fasting, through more good deeds. I will pay. He never felt himself to be in debt. Remember back in chapter 5, the Lord said, They that are whole, that is, those that are well, I have no need of a physician. If you're feeling well, you don't need to go to the doctor. And equally, if you don't feel yourself to be in debt, you're not going to ask the lender for forgiveness. So coming back to this ledger, there's a record of debt. But how could a lender forgive the debt? Evidently, 
the lender had to meet the demands that were recorded in that ledger himself. So we can't just forget that there was a debt. It was to be forgiven. But the lender would have to supply that money himself in order to cancel out what had been lent. The cost would be to the one that had made the loan. Uh, this brings us to the gospel. Because the ledger does testify of our sin. God is a record of the sin of all those that are outside of Christ. <clears throat> and even if it was only the debt from one day, it's a huge debt. But you think day after day, year after year, it's a huge debt. And the sinner has absolutely no ability to pay. There is no way that the very best of his deeds could cover his sin. It's impossible. But here is the gospel. Christ comes and Christ took the indebtedness. Christ took that record of debt. It was nailed with him to the cross. He met all the demands. And so before the Father we had this great debt, but Christ met it for us. He fulfilled the demands of the law. He has fulfilled what God demanded. And so some time back when I was preaching Romans chapter 4, we saw this idea of the ledger. That on one side there is the sin. Then Romans 4 speaks of imputing, counting, reckoning. That is, the gospel is not only that sin is forgiven. We need more than a neutral status. We need a positive righteousness. And here Jesus Christ, then he took our sin. He has blotted out the record. But he imputes his righteousness to our account. Christ is my friend. So I think we could put it like this then. The greatest lovers are the best at accounting. And I mean in the spiritual sense. And you can be good at counting numbers. But if you're not good at calculating the awful weight of your sin, then you're going to mess with this lady. She was able to see the huge debt. But in making that calculation, she was able then to see the greatness of forgiveness. How great is God's grace that all of that debt would be taken, wiped away. Wetner said, we are often permitted to fall into sin, but after being delivered from it, we can appreciate our salvation all the more. And there are times then the Lord permits even his children to fall into sin, that they would see afresh how great is the grace of God. It's not to excuse the sin, of course, but to see the greatness of the grace of God. Perhaps there's some loved one that you have been praying over, longing that they would be converted and sins are going further and further away, deeper and deeper into sin. Perhaps the Lord has permitted that. That one day they would be humbled. And they would be like this woman. That they would recognize, yes, I'm a great debt sinner. But I have a great, great Savior. Love then is not always in proportion to the amount of sin forgiven, but it is in proportion to our sense of the amount of sin forgiven. So it's not in proportion to the sin that has been forgiven, but our sense of it. 
And this is the, one of the great lessons then of this scene in this section. The great dead sinners. But to recognize that is the case. How great is God's forgiveness. And of course Paul took that, this then in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 in relation to the home. How can there be forgiveness? How can we forgive those that have wronged us in the home or in the workplace or wherever it might be? As Christ has forgiven you, forgive others. You say, but do you not realize what that person did to me? The Lord says, do you not realize what you did against me? Forgive. As you have been forgiven, the great lovers then rejoice in forgiveness, having the greatest understanding of God's nature. I want to say finally, they rejoice having the greatest understanding of God's provision. God's provision. That is, they have a great understanding of the Son of God, the one that God has provided. You see, the Pharisee. I had the question in his mind, can this one be a prophet? If he was really a prophet, surely God would have shown him what type of a woman this was and he wouldn't have allowed this to happen. But the Lord then shows, Simon, I even know what you're thinking. And I know all about this woman. But we can say the woman understood more about Jesus Christ than the Pharisee. That despite all of his reading and learning, she had a greater grasp of the truth of God, much greater than he did. In some ways you might say that her understanding was simpler. But she knew what she needed to know. She knew there was a welcome. And so she didn't have a doubt in her mind, will I be received or not? Will he allow me to do this? She knew she would be received. She knew there was a welcome and she came. She knew her sin would not make him unclean. She knew that by touching him that she would not contaminate him. Rather, he would cleanse her. You think of how here she anointed him with oil. Now, how much of the significance of this she really understood, I'm not sure. But in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil. So she came anointing him with the oil. She could, in effect, say, he is my prophet. He is not merely a prophet. He is the one that declares the truth, and he is the truth. He is the revelation of God. He is my priest. He is the one that has made satisfaction, or in her case, he will make satisfaction for my sin. He is the one that prays for me. He is my king. We take those three together. Christ is the prophet, the priest, and the king. It speaks of his mediatorial office. Jesus Christ is the mediator. He is the one that stands between God and man. And he is the mediator to forgive sin. And remember, that's the issue that comes then at the end of this scene. Who is this that forgives sins also? How can a man forgive sin? Because this is no ordinary man. This is God manifest in flesh. And as this woman came and took hold of the feet of Christ, she did so by faith. Perhaps it was trembling faith, it was certainly weeping faith. The Lord says, your faith has saved you because her faith took hold of a great Savior. 
So many today are concerned about their greatness of the, the greatness or otherwise of their faith. What our faith takes hold of is most vital. What a great Savior, my prophet, my priest, my king, the one who is the great mediator. Now seeing all of that, brought the love. Seeing all of that, she came in tears. She wanted to be where he was. She poured out the ointment, no budgeting, not letting other things take priority, not seeing this worship as a waste of time. She came perhaps pouring out all that she had. She was saying, I am not my own. I am bought with a price. Take my life and let me consecrate Lord to thee. Thomas Gibbons wrote these words, Forgiveness, it is a joyful sound to malefactors doomed to die. Lord, may this bliss in me be found, may I redeem in grace and joy. For this stupendous love of heaven, what grateful honours shall we show, where much transgression is forgiven, may love in equal ardour flow. Seeing the gospel today afresh, dear believer, may our love be deeper. As we come to a close, perhaps there is one and you have never come to Christ. And the Lord today sees all of your sin. And despite all that you may have thought about yourself up to this moment, you are a great death sinner. You have offended a holy God. But here is good news for you, dear lost one. There is a provision in Christ. There is one who came to bear away sin, to deal with this debt record. And therefore run to him for mercy even right now. He is willing and able to see. Come for mercy for your souls. We'll bow together please in prayer. <coughs> Perhaps the Lord has ministered to your heart today. And dear Christian, you recognize your love is not what it ought to have been. That ought to be the confession of every child of God. Come then and see not only the greatness of sin, but the greatness of this forgiveness. Be one then that will love much. Poor sinner, flee to Christ for mercy. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for the challenge of thy word. O oh Lord, take it, we pray, and write it upon every soul. O oh Lord, we yearn those that sit among us that are still unconverted that they would recognize their debt they would run for mercy and forgiveness dear Lord we pray even as we come to the table that our hearts will be humbled that there will at the very least be that inward grief As we weep over ourselves, but weeping then in joy at the greatness of the, that there is such a Savior as this. So linger with us at the table, we do pray, be with those that must go in the name of Jesus' name. I'll go to the door in case there are any who are unable to remain, and then in a moment or two, we'll